To say the early 2000s were a tumultuous time for Squaresoft would be an understatement. From trying to merge with rival company Annex, to clashes between Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi and company CFO Yoichi Wada, to releasing Final Fantasy Spirits Within, their first feature-length film, which would go on to become one of the biggest box office disasters in film history. It's shocking, then, that during this insane time for the company, a game came out that, frankly, shouldn't have worked, but it did. Kingdom Hearts released for the PlayStation 2 in 2002. The game would receive critical acclaim and go on to sell extremely well. So well, in fact, that it would kick off an entire series. Now, the original is held in high regard by fans of the franchise, with many saying that it's one of their favorite action RPGs. But what do I think of the game? Let's find out. For this video, the version I'll be looking at is the PlayStation 4 Final Mix version from 2017. This is, as far as I'm aware, the most up-to-date version of this game, featuring the best load times, 60 frames per second, and the cleanest looking visuals. Now with that quick note out of the way, this is my retrospective look back at Kingdom Hearts 1. I've been having these weird thoughts lately. Like, is any of this for real? Or not? Kingdom Hearts opens up on a tutorial section, set in this weird dream sequence. After which we open up on our first official level of the game, Destiny Islands. This opening level acts as two different things, a tutorial to get you used to the controls and to set up our main three characters, Sora, Riku, and Kairi. It's a fun opening level, which particularly does a great job at setting up the dynamic of our main trio. Riku is the older character, seeking independence from the home that he feels is holding him back. Kairi is the girl of the group, that the guys feel kind of protective of. Then there's Sora. A kid who wants nothing more than to go on adventures with his friends. But that adventure may not be exactly what he has in mind. As, after going through two days on the island, disaster strikes. A tornado of darkness strikes the island, bringing the Heartless to his home. At this point in the story, aside from the dream sequence, you've done no real fighting. Only play fighting with toy swords. But now, beings of pure darkness are here and you can't do anything. Sora, and in this case the player, does their best to find Riku and Kairi. Unfortunately, Riku thinks this is the escape he was waiting for, and decides to take the plunge into darkness. Sora is almost caught up in the darkness, but is saved by a twinkle of light that comes as the Keyblade, the main weapon of choice for Sora in this franchise as a whole. This changes the playing field entirely, as now you can actually take on the Heartless and clear the way to find Kairi. Unfortunately, Kairi is found in an almost zombie-like state, and a gust of wind flings her towards Sora, only for her to disappear. Remember this for later, trust me. After this, Sora is flung inside the tornado and has to fight Darkseid, which was the being from his dreams. After the fight, Sora is sucked up into the tornado, ending off Destiny Islands. While all that was happening, in another world, Disney Castle, King Mickey has vanished. He left a note explaining that the stars have been disappearing from the sky, so he needs to investigate. At the same time, he orders Donald and Goofy to find the Keyblade and that they need to go to Traverse Town, so that's what they do. When they arrive, they go to look for Leon, but we also discover and Sora has made his way to Traverse Town. Sora encounters Sid, Aerith, and Yuffie from Final Fantasy VII, and Squall 
or in this case Leon, from Final Fantasy VIII. They get our trio up to speed on the whole situation. Those beings of darkness are called the Heartless, and they are swallowing worlds. A man by the name of Ansem was studying the Heartless. However, he disappeared once the darkness reached his homeworld, Hollow Bastion, which just happens to be the home of our featured Final Fantasy characters. Before Sora can be introduced to Donald and Goofy, they are all attacked by the Heartless. One boss fight later, and our trio is finally together. They convince Sora to go with Donald and Goofy to search for his missing friends, Riku and Kairi. Overall, I really like the basic story setup. For one, it's easy to follow, which is pretty rare for this franchise. And two, it perfectly sets up everything you need to know for the rest of the game. That's all I'll say for the story at this point. As past this, the story kinda stops for a bit. So for now, let's talk about the other aspects of the game, like the presentation. Which, in my opinion, has held up extremely well. Characters and environments still look great all these years later. It's still really impressive that Square was able to take all of these Disney franchises, which were all presented in 2D, and make them all look great in 3D. Another point to make is that the Disney characters don't clash stylistically with the original and Final Fantasy characters. Considering how different these characters are, the fact that they work alongside each other is great. About the only thing to criticize is the kind of blank expressions and lip syncing throughout certain cutscenes in the story. Still though, most of the lip syncing and facial expressions are really good, so I can forgive that. While the presentation is great, it's the music that has stood the test of time and then some. Kingdom Hearts' soundtrack was composed by the legendary Yoko Shimomura. She made her name composing music for Street Fighter 2 and Super Mario RPG. But in my opinion, Kingdom Hearts is where she would become one of the greats in video game composing. She does it all in Kingdom Hearts, from upbeat island tunes to battles of the ultimate evil. In fact, here's a sample of some of the music you'll be hearing in Kingdom Hearts. As you can see, the music is incredibly varied and very good, but I can't leave the music section without mentioning Simple and Clean. Sung by Hikaru Utada, this opens the game with such an unbelievable style, you can't even joke about it, man. They even have a slowed down version for the closing credits. It's so good. I wish I could play it for you, but I have to avoid the copyright, so you'll just have to look it up on your own time. With that out of the way, that's it for the music section. Another aspect of the sound I want to give a special mention to is the voice acting. Kingdom Hearts is a bit of an odd case when it comes to the voice acting, as it's mostly a celebrity voice cast voicing the important characters. Haley Joel Osment does the heavy lifting as the main character Sora, and for being only 12 years old at the time, he turns in a solid performance. How did all this happen? I remember being in my room. <gasps> Wait a minute! What happened to my home? My island! Riku! Kairi! Hayden Penetier voices Kairi, and if that name sounds familiar, it's probably because you've seen her in shows like Nashville, and Heroes, and even films like Scream 4 and 6. There's something about this musty place. It reminds me of the secret place back home where we used to scribble on the walls. Remember? She's good, but I feel like she's the weakest link of the main trio. Speaking of the trio, let's talk about the final character in said trio, Riku. Riku is voiced by David Gallagher, who manages to give a great turn as Riku. David manages to make Riku sound threatening when he needs to be, while also giving him some nice vulnerable moments as well. Are they that important to you? More important than old friends. Instead of worrying about them, you should be asking about her. The rest of the cast is made up of returning Disney voice actors, 
These include Bill Farmer as Goofy, Tony and Selma as Donald Duck, James Woods as Hades. I know! You think I don't know? I wrote the contract! I know it says you're only required to kill Hercules in this tournament. But you gotta fight that kid to get to him! Come on! Man, I love Hades. And even Jim Cummings as Pooh and Tigger. There are more, but you get the point. A lot of the Disney characters are voiced by their original actors. This is great, as most of them give good performances and allows it to feel more closely tied to those original movies. I don't have much else to say about the sound department, so I think it's time that we move on to the gameplay, and this is where things get interesting. This is because Kingdom Hearts is an action RPG, meaning that the game carries over a lot of elements from traditional RPGs, such as leveling up your characters to get better moves, using magic spells, which also level up as you go through the game, and equipping newer and better weapons that also improve the strength of you and your party members. But in an action RPG, there is no waiting until the game says you can attack. You can attack whenever you want. You don't have to just stand there in a single point and just beg that the game lets the enemy miss you. Instead, you can dodge enemy attacks like you would normally think to do. Combat is where you see the action RPG elements first and foremost. And coming from a company mostly known for its turn-based RPG series, it plays really well here. Sora's got a pretty basic moveset, which you can see here. You have options for attacking, using magic, and using items. And a fourth option, which I'll touch on later. Each option is pretty self-explanatory, but looking into each option reveals where the depth of Kingdom Hearts lies. You see, Sora starts out with just a basic 3-hit combo, but as you go through the game, you can unlock combo extenders, which increase the amount of hits you can do in a combo. Same thing applies to attacking in the air. Magic is also pretty self-explanatory. Press the magic option, and then you'll have a lot of options to choose. I'm not going to go through each spell, but here are some highlights. Blizzard is my personal go-to option in the early game. Good range, decent damage, and covers a wide enough area. Cure is a basic healing spell. Then, there's Arrow, which is the best spell in the game. Not even a question. It's a defense spell that lessens enemy damage to the player, and with the final upgrade, can block projectiles. Speaking of upgrades, most of your spells are automatically upgraded as you go through the story, with some exceptions, the main one being Arrow. One important thing to point out about magic spells is that you can assign them to a shortcut menu. This allows for much easier spell casting. Then, for the items, potions heal you, ethers recover magic, and elixirs completely restore magic and health. There are variants of all of these that have increased effects and can be used on the whole team. Now for that fourth option, throughout the game Sora unlocks the ability to summon different Disney characters. These include Simba, Genie, Dumbo, Bambi, Mushu, and Tinkerbell. Each one has different abilities. Simba can do an area of effect attack, while Tinkerbell can continuously heal you and even save you from death if your health runs out. Gonna be honest, besides those, I don't really use the summons that often. I just never really think to use them in the middle of a battle. I'd just rather use my basic attacks. Now that we've covered most of Sora's options for combat, let's take a look at some of the other things he can do. Aside from the previously mentioned arrow, Sora has two other defensive options against enemies. Dodge Roll is, in my experience, the more used of the two. Pretty self-explanatory, you dodge out of the way of enemy attacks, but it absolutely gets the job done. The other defensive option is the Guard ability. Again, very self-explanatory. You can guard against attacks. However, Guard does not get nearly as much use as the Dodge Roll. This would change as the series went on but for this first outing, it's fine. Other options for Sora are his platforming options. That's right, it's a PS2 game from the early 2000s, so of course there's some platforming. It's not terrible, but it doesn't feel great until near the end when you gain all of your traversal moves. Speaking of those, those consist of high jump, glide, and super glide. The only one of these I really like is super glide, but you literally unlock that move at the 11th hour. So most of the things that you could have used that ability for have already been done up to this point. So yeah, 
the traversal options are okay, and the platforming as a whole is pretty bad. But there's very little of it, so it doesn't really affect my overall experience. And now that we've covered all we can do as Sora, what about the party members? The party members are interesting in the fact that you can't directly control their actions, like in most Final Fantasy games. You can, however, heavily influence their actions. You can do this mainly in two ways. One, you can equip and unequip different abilities to your party members, and you can customize the way they behave in battle. You do this in the Customize tab of your main menu. I definitely think about how you want your party members set up in order to avoid the sometimes interesting party AI. I'm looking at you, Donald. Now, Donald and Goofy stick with you for most of the game, with the occasional Disney guest joining your party temporarily. When these temporary members join your party, you have the option to swap out Donald or Goofy for these guys. You can do this, but I normally wouldn't, as I would prefer to keep leveling up my main party members. This is the basics of the party system, as aside from this, their moveset is very similar to Sora's. They can attack, cast spells, and use items just like Sora can. Also like Sora, they can equip different weapons and items to increase certain stats, like strength, defense, and HP. Now that is everything there is to discuss when it comes to the gameplay. It mostly consists of combat, platforming, and exploration. Now it is time to discuss possibly the most iconic part of Kingdom Hearts, the worlds slash levels. Actually, I feel like I forgot something. Oh, wait. I forgot about the gummy ship. So, in order to get from world to world, you have to go through these on-rails missions with your ship. And they suck. Plain and simple. I don't like these. You can upgrade your ship to make these more tolerable, but I still don't care. That's all I have to say about the gummy ship. Again, I don't like them. Now we can talk about the levels. That's right. It's time to look at the main attraction of the series. We're going to go through the levels one by one. I'll look at the design of the level itself, along with the challenges it presents, and finally, if the story progresses at all. I should mention that I'll be saying world slash level interchangeably throughout this segment. They mean the same thing, but I just wanted to make that clear before starting. With that out of the way, let's go. Now before you even get to the first official level, you begin in this really fascinating opening. Sora is walking on top of these stained glass murals of Disney princesses, all while this mesmerizing choir music is leading you to think that this isn't going to be your average Disney game. At a certain point, you're met with three pillars, and each one has a different object at the top of it. A sword, staff, and shield. Now before we go any further, it should be noted that you can pick one of the listed weapons and get rid of one of the weapons. Whichever one you pick will determine your upgrade path for the whole game. Whichever weapon you give up will lead to you having a lower starting stat for the selected category. So pick wisely. Also, you'll be asked a series of questions and depending on which choices you make, it will determine how quickly you level up throughout the game. Mentioning all this might not seem that important, but I bring that up because the choices you make here will really change how the game goes for you. Before you leave this section, you get into a boss fight with a major recurring enemy throughout the series, Darkseid. After defeating him, that'll mark the end of this section, and then we finally begin the first real level of the game, Destiny Islands, which is a great opening level for a couple reasons. One, it does a great job at introducing the characters and their relationships. Two, it eases the player into the controls really well. And three, there's a lot of fun side things to do, from fighting the other kids to getting into a race with Riku. It's all great. The level has a massive environment shift halfway through, when the island is invaded by the Heartless. It provides a nice shift in tone from the happy tones of the last bit. Overall, very good level. Next up is Traverse Town, one of my personal favorites in the game. From an extremely cozy vibe to a rising difficulty curve that still feels natural, 
there's a lot to like about Traverse Town. It's also here where you see the Final Fantasy crossover at its most potent. Put all that together and you get a really enjoyable level. Then there's Wonderland, which is a fairly boring level in my eyes. This could be down to me having not seen the original film, but even if I had seen it, I don't think it would have saved it from the generally uninteresting design. Also, I really dislike the boss, because actually hitting him is more challenging than anything else he does. Enough said, moving on to Olympus Coliseum. Now, I'm really mixed on this level. On the one hand, the tournaments are a great gameplay feature. Hades is my favorite Disney villain, and Cloud being here is a nice touch. But on the other hand, aside from said tournaments, there's really nothing else to do here. So again, I'm torn, but it's still fun, and Cloud showing up is a nice treat. And then there's Deep Jungle. Okay, let's just say it. This is a bad level. And the major reason? There's way too much back and forth from one location to the other, with little to no combat until the latter half. This doesn't seem that bad, but trust me, when you're playing the level, it feels like it goes on forever. The only thing I like about this level is the Clayton boss fight. But even this boss fight can totally be made pathetically easy if you know the right strategy. Wish I used it if I'm being honest right now. After a revisit to Traverse Town, we move on to Agraba, aka the Aladdin level. This is by far my favorite Disney level in the game. The vertical layout is a nice change of pace, and there's actual combat throughout the level, unlike Deep Jungle. And there's a lot of story development compared to the previous levels. About the only thing I don't like is the Cave of Wonders section and the boss fights. While fighting the Cave of Wonders is a cool idea, the execution is just not great. Jafar, on the other hand, is just a bad boss. In the first phase, he refuses to stand still, and in the second, he's insultingly easy. Even with that though, this is a great level. This next level is kind of tricky to get to. You need to go out of your way to get to this level, and only then can you play Monstro. After the high point that was the Agrabah level, this is a big step down. Weird design, very confusing maze layout, and a boss fight that's just mediocre, and this level is just not that good. Then, there's Atlantica. I'm not exaggerating when I say that Atlantica is one of my least favorite levels ever in any game, period. There are two major reasons for this. One is that this merman form that Sora takes in takes half of your abilities away. Yep, the abilities that you've spent a majority of the game unlocking are worthless, including block, dodge roll, and any combo extenders you got. What do you get instead? Horrible swimming controls! Oh joy! Second major reason is that parts of the level are literally inaccessible for the first half. You need to get the dolphin kick, which you only get after the first fight with Ursula. But by that point, you're pretty much done with Atlantica. With this being said, I don't find it shocking that you can completely skip Atlantica in this game. Yeah, you heard right. I actually only beat it near the end of the game because I wanted the footage. But after getting it, yeah, I think I'm just going to stay away from Atlantica. Moving on to Halloween Town. And this is a decent level. The scenery is quite unique in this level compared to the rest. Not to mention, interacting with the characters is pretty entertaining. But the bosses are forgettable. Still, a decent level. Neverland though, isn't a decent level. In fact, it's pretty bad. For a level called Neverland, all you do is explore Captain Hook's ship. And it's extremely cramped. So exploration is pretty limited. Not to mention, there are points when you just have no idea where to go and you just end up being like, how was I supposed to know to go there? Moving on, the only thing I like in this level is the mini-boss with Heartless Sora, which is probably one of my favorite bosses in the game. Oh, 
Hollow Bastion is easily the best world in the game. For starters, this level is pure payoff. Everything story-wise finally climaxes in this level. From the rivalry with Sora and Riku, to finally finding Kairi, while over on the gameplay side, it only gets better. All of the moves you've unlocked get used to their full potential, meaning combat reaches its peak here. Then, there's the bosses, of which I find all of them to be extremely enjoyable, especially the last one, which might just be my favorite boss in the game. Finally, the atmosphere of this level. Since this is an original world, you don't know anything about it, so there's a mysterious feeling when walking around. Then, there's the music, which only adds to the mysterious feeling. It's not even a contest. Hollow Bastion is my favorite world in the game. But we're still not done. We have two more worlds left to go. This includes the final main story level, the end of the world. I love the design of this place. It truly feels like the epitome of evil itself. To go along with that, we get to fight the Disney version of Satan himself, Charnerbog. It's an improvement on the earlier Ursula fight, which I didn't mention because it was bad. And the music here, which is Night on Bald Mountain, makes it seem like the fate of the universe is truly at stake. Unfortunately, the goodwill from that boss does not carry over into the last challenge of this level. You see, before you get into the last rest, which is the room right before the final boss, you have to go through an insane gauntlet of enemies. This starts off with Behemoth, a boss fight that isn't that bad, but is repeated at nauseum. I had to fight him again so many times that I personally think that Behemoth is now my least favorite boss in the game. Then, once you're done with him, you have to fight the rest of the enemy gauntlet, which is insanely hard. This final test is, in my opinion, harder than the final boss himself, and when you die here, you have to repeat the whole gauntlet again, including Behemoth. This whole section is a little too much, if you ask me. I mean, your thumbs will hate you by the end of it all. With all that being put together, this is a fine level, but after Hollow Bastion, it's a bit of a letdown. Now this is the last level required for completing the story. But this isn't the last level, period. There's one more level which is completely optional, and that would be the 100 Acre Wood, aka the Winnie the Pooh level. Here's a quick setup. During a second visit to Traverse Town, you get access to Merlin the Wizard's Lair, where you give him a book fixed up by Sid. Unfortunately, the book is still missing pages, which you can go out and find to complete it. Finding a page of the book gives access to another area of the world, and each area of the world is a mini-game which you need to complete in order to see the next part of the story in this level. It's a bit basic, and some of the mini-games are just not that fun, but let me tell you why I actually love this level. Going through the game, there's an emphasis placed on the situation our characters are going through. The worlds are being swallowed by darkness, all life is gonna end, and my friend is actually a terrible person. But here, in this place, none of that matters. All that matters is that these simple, wholesome characters are okay. This level is the epitome of pure bliss. And that, in the end, is why I love this level. With that, we have finally gone through all of the levels in Kingdom Hearts. If you want to know my favorites, here they are. Agrabah, Hollow Bastion, and 100 Acre Wood. As for my least favorite, Deep Jungle, Atlantica, and Neverland. So there you go. The world selection here is solid, but the quality of each world varies greatly, and is not as much of a highlight to me like in the later games. Now with that out of the way, let's get back to the story. Now when we left off, our trio of Sora, Donald, and Goofy have left Traverse Town to find Riku, Kairi, and King Mickey. It's at this point that the player begins going through the Disney worlds. Now when going through the Disney worlds, stuff does happen, 
but rarely is any of it actually important. So for this part, I'm going to summarize the important stuff that happens and skip the rest. It becomes apparent after a couple of encounters that Riku is beginning to be corrupted. He begins working with Maleficent as part of her evil plans to capture the Princesses of Heart. A group of seven princesses with pure hearts that Maleficent is going to use to unlock the door to Kingdom Hearts. Riku also starts to become a problem in general. In the Monstro level, he kidnaps Pinocchio to see how a puppet can have a heart. Granted, he's doing this because Kairi has lost her heart, supposedly to the Heartless. But even with that, it's crazy to see this guy that you started out the game with by fighting with toy swords to literally kidnapping a child. But going back to Sora, who is going the exact opposite way that Riku is going. Because as Riku goes deeper into the darkness, Sora only grows brighter in the light. He begins making friends and helping everyone in the Disney worlds by sealing the keyholes. For context, most of the worlds in the game have a keyhole, which, while open, allows the Heartless to make their way into the world. So sealing the keyhole is stopping the Heartless from coming into their worlds. With that out of the way, let's start explaining the story beat by beat again. Beginning in Neverland. Sora meets up with Riku again, who seemingly is able to control the Heartless, showing just how far he's fallen. After going through the ship, Sora meets up with Kairi, who is unresponsive. This is the final major plot relevant moment before the gang arrives at Hollow Bastion. When arriving there, the beast from Beauty and the Beast is there. Turns out, his entire world was consumed by the Heartless, and Bell was kidnapped, but he fought his way to get to Hollow Bastion. Keep in mind, this should be impossible. This alone makes Beast one of the most powerful characters in the game, through this fact alone. But, he's not powerful enough to take on Riku, who puts Beast down temporarily. Before he can do anything beyond that, Sora, Donald, and Goofy get in his way. Unfortunately, it's at this point that Riku reveals that he is actually the true Keyblade wielder. Sure enough, Riku is able to take away the Keyblade from Sora, and then Riku leaves Sora behind, thinking he is no longer a threat. Following behind Riku is Donald and Goofy, who, if you remember, were assigned to find the Keyblade, and so that's why they go with Riku. Sora, left behind, feels defeated, but Beast gets up and continues to go on, determined to get what he came for. Bell, Sora, inspired by Beast and probably realizing that Kairi is still likely trapped in the castle, decides to go with Beast. This is one of my favorite parts of the game. Without the Keyblade, Sora is basically useless. You do little to no damage at this point. And you have to pretty much rely on Beast for doing anything substantial to the Heartless. But what this does is it shows just how strong-willed Sora is. He has nothing left. His rival has humiliated him, his new friends have abandoned him, and all the powers he had now are worthless. But he doesn't care. He only cares about saving the people that are important to him. This is one of Sora's defining characteristics. He'll do the right thing no matter the cost. It's one of the things that makes him a truly great character in my eyes. Eventually, Sora and Beast are separated, just as Sora finally catches up to Riku. Riku tries to kill Sora, but Sora is saved by Goofy, who decides to forego the King's orders and leave the Keyblade Wilder. Donald immediately joins him, and the next scene is one that would go on to define the series. How will you fight without a weapon? I know now I don't need the Keyblade. I've got a better weapon. My heart! <laughs> Your heart? What good will that weak little thing do for you? Although my heart may be weak, it's not alone. It's grown with each new experience, and it's found a home with all the friends I've made. I've become part of their heart just as they've become a part of mine. And if they think of me now and then, if they don't forget me, then our hearts will be one. I don't need a weapon. My friends are my power. Huh? Huh? Before we go any further, let me explain Riku and why he was able to take the Keyblade away. So, Riku is the rightful wielder of the Keyblade. However, when the islands were being swallowed by the darkness, 
the Keyblade chooses to go with Sora instead. So essentially, through most of the game, the Keyblade is on loan to Sora, which is why when Riku reaches out for the Keyblade at the beginning of Hollow Bastion, it goes to him quite easily. However, Sora's bond with his friends is stronger than any power Riku can conjure up. So that's why the Keyblade leaves Riku to go with Sora. The fight with Riku is a fairly good one, but is, in my opinion, overshadowed by the next fight with him. After defeating Riku, he flees, only to be confronted by a familiar presence from earlier in the game. I forgot to mention it earlier, but before Sora's home was swallowed by the Heartless, he was visited by a mysterious man, claiming their world had been connected to the darkness. Now he returns and convinces Riku to completely give himself to the darkness. Not long after that, Maleficent discovers that even with all the princesses they've gathered, the door to Kingdom Hearts won't open. She then comes to the conclusion that Kairi is the final princess of heart, but since she is missing her heart, the door won't open. But Maleficent has no time to deal with this issue, as Sora finally catches up to her, and after an admittedly easy battle, she goes away. Now before you go thinking that was pathetic, go into the next room. The trio catches up to her easily, where Riku is there, with a keyblade, and decides to show Maleficent what it can do. This keyblade holds the power to unlock people's hearts. Allow me to demonstrate. Behold! Now, open your heart. Surrender it to the darkness. Become darkness itself! This is it! This power! <laughs> darkness! The true darkness! That's right, you get to fight Dragon Maleficent. And let me tell you, this fight is no joke. This is maybe the hardest Disney character fight in the game. I'd recommend as soon as the battle starts deploying Tinkerbell. Trust me, it comes in handy a lot during this fight. But after defeating Maleficent, the game continues going through the castle and they finally catch up to Kairi. This is where Sora realizes that Kairi is a princess of heart, and that her heart is missing, and that it is actually inside of him. Remember this moment? Yep. This is the moment where Kairi's heart went into Sora. You even hear Kairi call out to Sora before Riku is able to hit him. Sora! Forget it. There's no way you're taking Kairi's heart. This begins the best boss fight in the whole game. This fight with Riku actually mirrors the fight you had with him on the island. A lot of the moves that Riku pulls off are powered up versions from the play fight back on the island. Also, if anyone watched my old Devil May Cry videos, you'll know I love boss fights where it feels like you and the boss are on equal footing. This boss is a perfect example of that. In addition to that, I love duel type bosses. You and someone else, face to face, one on one. Simple as that. The difficulty is also something to note about this fight. Kingdom Hearts is difficult, no doubt about it. A lot of the early game fights are particularly rough, but Riku here is where things get really tough. Even though I've beaten this game before, this fight gave me a really tough time going through. However, it only made it more satisfying when I finally beat him. Now, after you do beat him, Sora realizes he needs to free Kairi's heart. Remembering what Riku's Keyblade can do, Sora decides to make the ultimate sacrifice.
there's little time to mourn as we finally come face to face with the game's main villain, Ansem. Riku's spirit manages to stop him temporarily. Kairi, Donald, and Goofy manage to escape thanks to this. But, as they're escaping, we turn our focus to a particular Heartless. Then, shockingly, the game lets you play as said Heartless. It's a bit of a weird experience, since you've been fighting these enemies, now you're controlling one of them. There's not much you can actually do as the Heartless. You can only move and jump. Speaking of moving, you need to get back to an earlier area in the level by essentially falling off the map. Once you reach that earlier area, Donald tries to stop you from getting close to Kyrie, but Kyrie feels the presence of Sora in this Heartless. The gang is attacked by a group of Heartless, and just as it seems that Sora and Kyrie are doomed, Sora transforms back into his human form. There's little time for celebration now, as Heartless begin overrunning the place. Beast buys us time to escape, but he stays behind, determined to save Belle. We immediately transition back to Traverse Town, where our gang has regrouped. We determine that we need to go back to Hollow Bastion, as the darkness released from the door is spreading to all worlds. Before we do that, we need to go back to the tunnel to pick up a special item, where we get a special conversation with Kairi. No matter how deep the darkness, a light shines within. I guess it's more than just a fairy tale. Well, let's go! You can't go! Why not? Because it's way too dangerous. Come on, Sora. We made it this far by sticking together. You can't go alone. Kairi, even if we're apart, we're not alone anymore, right? I can't help? You'd kind of be in my way. <laughs> okay. You win. Take this. It's my lucky charm. Be sure to bring it back to me. Don't worry. I will. Promise? Promise. Don't ever forget. Wherever you go, I'm always with you. After that, it's time to go back to Hollow Bastion. We meet up with Beast and get into the castle. We meet up with Belle and the rest of the princesses. Then we go into the door to shut it. Afterwards, we have a final conversation with our Traverse Town friends. We learn that once we defeat Ansem, everyone will return to their homeworld, and we won't be able to see them. Despite that, Sora realizes what he must do. He seals the keyhole at Hollow Bastion and makes his way to the end of the world. Once we reach the end of the world, we see what's happened to the worlds that were devoured by the Heartless. Going through this world feels like a true build-up to the end. The music that's the same as the opening tutorial, and making quick detours to previous worlds to battle a group of Heartless in each. Some games have trouble making the end game feel truly epic, but Kingdom Hearts does not have this problem. After fighting Charnerbog, and the previously mentioned final wave of tough enemies, we make it to the final rest, which, as the name implies, is the last resting point before you fight the final boss. With that being said, I feel like this is a good opportunity to go over some of the side content you can do before we dive into the ending of the game. Let's start out with the Trinity Marks. Throughout the game, you see these symbols in the levels. When you see one, go up and interact to allow the trio to do a variety of actions. In the beginning, you can only interact with a single type of Trinity, but as you go through the game, you unlock the ability to interact with more Trinities. I don't really have that much to say about the Trinity Marks. You should probably do the ones you can unlock later, as they have some cool stuff in them. Next up is the Dalmatians, which is something every player should do. Throughout the levels, the Dalmatian puppies from the Disney film are hidden around after being separated from their parents. It's up to you to go through each level and find the chest they're hiding in. Now the reason I say every player should do this is because of what you get when you find all the puppies. You see, way back in the game, you unlock the ability Arrow. This ability starts out as a pretty useful defensive spell. 
but upon finding all the Dalmatians, you unlock the final upgrade for Arrow, Aroga. This spell is insane, and you'll always have it equipped to your magic shortcut menu after you unlock it. After those two are done, there are only two more things to focus on, and both are primarily combat focused. The Olympus tournaments and secret bosses, starting with the tournaments. Throughout the game, you'll occasionally be told that a new tournament has unlocked at the Colosseum. These are pretty basic, but very fun. Each tournament presents 10 rounds of various enemies, with the final round being a boss character. The Hades Cup is an exception to this, as there are 50 rounds to go through, with the boss fight at every 10th round. I would definitely recommend doing all of these for various reasons. One, after completing the Pegasus Cup, you unlock Strike Raid, which is easily the best move slash ability in the whole game. Press the triangle button and use one magic block, and boom, you're invincible and you throw the Keyblade doing good damage while again being invincible. Second reason, for doing the tournaments, you gain experience points, so it's a convenient way to level up Sora. Third, aside from Strike Raid, you can unlock various other things by doing these tournaments magic upgrades, new weapons, and the story conclusion for Olympus Coliseum. Now the final reason is that these are just really fun to go through. Simple as that. Now the last extra thing to talk about are the secret bosses. These are the things that you'll likely wait until after you beat the final boss to take on, because these are the biggest challenge you'll face in the whole game. There are five secret bosses, Kurtzisa, Phantom, Ice Titan, Unknown, and the One-Winged Angel himself, Sephiroth. Again, these bosses are the biggest challenge in the entire game. I should know. <clears throat> no comment on that one. Now, I will say, out of the secret bosses, Unknown has the best reward for beating him, which we'll talk about near the end of the video, so just wait a little bit on that. Now those are all the important side quests I can think of, so with that, I think it's time for the final boss. Now that we're back in the final rest, it's time to come face to face with Ansem. We catch up to Ansem, and he and Sora have a final conversation. I want to also take time to point out Billy Zane as Ansem. He manages to give an impressive performance as the villain of the game, making him sound over the top, but at the same time, quite menacing. So you have come this far, and still you understand nothing. Every light must fade, every heart return to darkness! Now it's time to get to the fight itself. This is a five phase boss fight. This first phase is a lot harder than I remembered. Specifically this one attack, that if it hits you, he will do damage over time and you just have to hold out until the attack is done. Other than that, this first phase is pretty fun. After that, we get separated from Donald and Goofy for phases two and three. Now for phase two, this isn't that much of a problem, as phase two, it's just a rematch with Darkseid. This is the easiest phase of the fight, but I still enjoy it for the story purpose. Think about it. You started out the game by fighting this guy. You did very little damage and had no abilities at that point in the game. Here though, things have changed. Darkseid doesn't stand a chance against Sora. So with that in mind, phase two is pretty easy. But phase three is not easy. Phase 3 Ansem comes back and carries over all of his Phase 1 attacks, with new ones as well. This fight is no joke. I came close to dying at several points during this boss fight. You need to stay on your toes the entire time, as Ansem isn't going to give you a second to rest. Once you manage to beat that phase, then things start to get really crazy. All of a sudden, you're teleported to this weird place, 
where we have apparently found Kingdom Hearts and Ansem shows up with a giant alien looking spaceship. Donald and Goofy are once again separated from you as you take on Ansem in a new form. This fight is still hard, but not as hard as Phase 3. Ignore me dying in the background. Ansem packs in an almost entirely new attack set, but the lasers that follow you are more challenging than any attack he has in this phase. Beating that phase leads to Ansem retreating into his ship, which means it's time to get Donald and Goofy back. To do this, you need to attack the various parts of the ship. Doing so allows you to free Donald and Goofy. Now I know I mentioned the music earlier in this video, but the music in this boss fight is incredible! Once again, credit to Yoko Shimomura for an incredible soundtrack. This elevates the fight to an insanely epic proportions. It keeps you pumped up for the entire fight, and it reaches a peak when you get to the final phase. With Donald and Goofy finally back at your side, Ansem comes out of hiding to begin Phase 5 of the fight. This phase is pretty easy at this point, because it's just Phase 4, but you have Donald and Goofy this time. But even with that, it's still incredible. This boss fight overall is great. Each phase introduces a new challenge and it's a great joy to go through. But now, I think it's time for this boss fight to end. Ansem, in a last ditch effort to win, calls out for the darkness within Kingdom Hearts. But Sora proclaims, You're wrong. I know now, without a doubt, Kingdom Hearts is light. <sighs> After Ansem's defeat, a swarm of Heartless show up from the Realm of Darkness, so our trio try to go close the door. They're struggling, but Riku shows up from behind the door, forgot to mention that Riku ends up in the Realm of Darkness, my bad, to help them close it. This still isn't enough, but a familiar face shows up to help finish the job. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, Steve. Now, Sora, let's close this door for good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Don't worry. There will always be a door to the light. Sora, you can trust King Mickey. Now, they're coming. Donald, Goofy, thank you. Take care of her. With the door finally closed, Sora sees Kairi. Unfortunately, Kairi is being pulled away as the worlds are being separated again. Sora manages to say goodbye to her before being separated. We then focus on Kairi, who is seeing Destiny Islands being rebuilt after being swallowed by the darkness at the beginning of the game. The final main shot shows Kairi seeing a drawing on the wall that Sora had made at the beginning of the game, and we see Kairi making a response to the drawing, and we roll credits to a slow version of Simple and Clean. During the credits, we even see all the worlds we went through, living a happy life thanks to the actions of Sora. I love this. It shows that our actions meant something, that characters we interacted with are ultimately better off because of us. Now with this, we conclude the story of Kingdom Hearts. Did you think I had forgotten?
continue after the credits and you encounter a secret ending. This ending is titled Another Side, Another Story, and is exclusive to the Final Mix version of the game. It actually teases the story of Kingdom Hearts 2 and Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2. No matter what you do, you get the secret ending, but if you manage to beat Unknown before you fight Ansem, you get an extended version of this ending. But now, for real, that's the end of the story. I love the story in Kingdom Hearts. It manages to keep me invested and entertained the whole way through. The characters are entertaining as well, with special shoutouts to the main trio of Sora, Donald, and Goofy. Their chemistry starts out good and only gets better as the game goes on. Even if the story kind of stops during some of the Disney worlds, the plot still manages to stay entertaining. Last thing to mention about the story is that it's relatively simple. I mention this because the simplicity gets long gone after this game, so I mention it now so we can appreciate it while we have it. Now that I've gone entirely through the story, I want to quickly sum up my thoughts on the gameplay. As, while I have explained the gameplay thoroughly, I don't feel like I have properly given my thoughts on it. There's a lot to like in Kingdom Hearts. It's still really fun to go through levels defeating the Heartless. Going through the game and unlocking more spells and combo extenders only makes it get better and better as you go through the game. The boss fights are mostly great, and there's, in my opinion, a nice difficulty curve throughout most of the game. That being said, it's not perfect, as it can be considered slow nowadays when compared to later Kingdom Hearts games. The platforming is also pretty bad, with some very basic options at your disposal. And while most of the bosses are great, some are quite frustrating and not fun to fight. Of course, there's also the gummy ship, which again, is just bad. Enough said about that. Kingdom Hearts has aged poorly in some ways. The platforming is awkward, certain levels are worse than others, and compared to later games, it can seem slow. But that still doesn't stop me from loving this game. I still find it to be extremely fun, the story captivating, and the music to be an absolute joy to listen to. Overall, it's still an incredible game today. It's a game that when I play it, I see the passion of the people who made it. I see a character designer turned director who wanted to prove himself. I see people who probably grew up loving Disney films and wanted to capture the magic of those films in this game. But above all, I see a silly Disney game that defied the odds and became a classic. Thank you all for watching this video. I'm not the first to make a video on Kingdom Hearts, but this is a franchise that means a lot to me. I really wanted to express my passion for this franchise and I hope it came across well enough in this video. Once again, thank you all for watching. When we return to Kingdom Hearts, we'll be taking a look at Kingdom Hearts Re-Chain of Memories. But until then, later everyone.